Uh, let me begin by acknowledging the people of the Boonwurrung and Woiwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands we have the absolute pleasure of uh, listening to, well, we better be freaking awesome now, Libby, <laughs> pressure, uh, listening to, Le uh, to Libby. Um, we also want to acknowledge their ancestors and elders past and present, and I'd also like to do an important acknowledgement of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and traditional owners across Australia whose land, on whose lands and waters we not only do our business, we also live and engage and hopefully act lawfully um, in everything that we do. So welcome everyone. Thank you again for your uh, turnout because this room is not easy to find. So you get at least um, an A plus for at least finding the space because uh, it was just pointed out to me that on some invitations the room didn't show up and when you see building 12, level 12, you go, okay, that's Narnia. It doesn't exist, <laughs> but here we are. So, uh, and we, 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 it does exist and we're all here. Uh, this is the second in the sem uh, seminar series for the Bunjagiri, not just the project, but what uh, we hope is Bunjagiri becomes a way of being. And tonight we have the absolute pleasure and honor uh, to have Professor Libby Porter deliver um, this uh, lecture or this seminar. And it's not just a how do we live lawfully. Um, what Libby has been able to exemplify and certainly show us all is how non-Indigenous people can even conceive of and then practise what it is to be in lawful relations, how to actually live lawfully, to conduct oneself in that lawful framework. And that is the possibility, the prospect of Bunjigiri, and to remind people that Bunjigiri is not just words literally translated to um, shared futures. Uh, there were Wiradjuri words uh, that have significant concept behind them, which is ask what it is uh, to share with us. So it is a, it's a way of actually talking yourself through the activity of what is worth sharing with us. It's not just what do I want and what do I need and therefore what can I share about the future. There is a really important element of what is worth sharing or what is uh, to be shared with us and with us being Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, places and things. So, and Giddy is futures. So it's those kinds of things that you actually start to, the more that we remind ourselves, and it's a bit like any um, translation of Aboriginal words, they're not mere translations. So spend some time to actually go, what is the concept? And I just said to Libby before, excuse me, I had jalapenos on the way, so I'm either gonna burp or fart or both, <laughs> and it's not now sitting well. Um, wow, you're not gonna get that back, Libby. Uh, but, um, and it is to think of, a bit, think of what Libby's about to talk us through is as you get to know words, know words deeply, know words as indicators, as invitations, as possibilities, as relation, so, because what sits behind words are um, opportunities and translation should offer, offer an opportunity to think and be different. Um, not from something else, but to think and be different for oneself. So I better do Libby's introduction because I gave my talk last time, so I better shut up. Uh, so I want it's very hard to do justice to, um, to Libby, uh, Professor Libby Porter, uh, because as somebody who is friends with Libby and somebody who works with Libby, the, the depth of her work and the influence it has on us as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is quite profound. And you're going to hear um, from Libby about how that actually um, affects, should affect non-Indigenous people. But her bio is actually really important because status and place and how you know yourself is intricately linked to how not only you know yourself, but how do you want others to know you? So Libby, 
Professor Libby Porter, as it says here, is an RMIT Vice Chancellor's Principal Research Fellow. So that means she's the, she's the bomb baby. Um, <laughs> Libby is a planner and urban geographer, working on the role of planning and urban development in dispossession and, dis and displacement and what we might do about it. Her research has examined Indigenous rights in, in urban and environmental planning, cities and diversity, gentrification and displacement through urban renewal, the impact of mega events on cities, and we're predicting that Melbourne will be 8 million by what, 2050, uh, and urban sustainability and urban informality. Her current work is in the areas of critical property studies, urban governance, decolonisation and settler cities, and on children's sense of space and place. Oh my God, do you sleep at all, Libby? Uh, Libby is a staunch supporter and actor, an actor in our Bunjigiti project, and has showed considerable leadership interrogating how Bunjigiti, this what we're thinking we're talking to do, can be known in a discipline specific manner. And as people who participated in the workshops earlier this week, discipline is a bounded form of knowledge. It's not just something that exists, it's actually got its boundary. Libby's got academic appointments in the UK and, in, and Australia in, in as a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. And prior to and continuing in her academic life, she, works in, she worked in urban planning practice and policy, applied research in both local and state government in Victoria, and what, uh, was a member of the expert advisory panel for Melbourne 2030. So that maybe it was 2030 that we might hit 8 million. She is currently assistant editor, uh, editor for planning, theory and practice, leading the interface section and is a co-founder of Planners Network UK. Please, please make welcome Professor Libby Porter. Wow, thank you very much, Mark, for that extraordinary introduction. Um, I'm feeling a bit um, overwhelmed and um, that I'm sure you will discover that I'm vastly more humble than all of that <laughs> um, and don't tend to think of myself um, in those kinds of ways. I probably should turn the lights down a little bit, I think, because it's not, the screen isn't very clear, which means I'm going to plunge you into darkness. Are you ready? Or well, maybe I shouldn't do that while people are walking down the stairs. I have instant catastrophe. <laughs> okay, now I'm doing it. All right, we're good. So as Mark said, I want to talk about um, my own journey, I guess, in what I've described here as learning to live lawfully on country. And to begin, um, we should, of course, to acknowledge um, where we are, um, that we meet on the unceded lands of the Bunwurrung and Woiwurrung speaking nations, speaking peoples, um, and to acknowledge that this is country, even though we may be in Narnia, up on level 12 of building 12 in a you know, highly developed, um, in an urbanisation context setting, um, but we are nonetheless enveloped in country. Um, we're always in country, wherever we are um, across this continent. So I want to acknowledge this as country, as a specific country, that of the Woiwurrung, Bunwurrung speaking peoples, um, and to acknowledge and pay respects to elders past and present and emerging, uh, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room, my respects to you, uh, and to all of the first peoples, in fact, that over whom I have gained um, the most enormous enrichment across my life um, thus far, hopefully it's not ending soon, um, <laughs> uh, around the world. Um, um, huge respects and acknowledgement to you also. I also want to acknowledge um, that country is a life force and it's a life force that sustains all of us. Um, and so for me, thinking about um, my position um, in this place, uh, in, in what we now call Melbourne, um, and that of my family as uninvited guests on Wurundjeri country where we live, I like to think of the ways in which I can um, be at home by thinking about um, the place that I live as country um, and something as a life force that, in, that enfolds all of us um, and enriches and sustains and nourishes all of us. So this is part, I think, of the work of coming into a response-able relationship um, to country, as I'll try and talk about. So I'm going to try and give you a bit of a sense of my own personal journey um, and along the way, um, hopefully, that will sound broadly coherent and professorial-like. 
rather than just be a, ram a sort of ramble through my life. Um, and, uh, and I've tried to kind of frame this um, as, a, as a story that's really one um, for me about learning that I was enacting and performing being a good white woman, um, which I'll try and unpack a little bit more, um, to beginning to understand a, a different way of being in relationship to Indigenous sovereignties, where it, wherever that may be, um, but particularly being um, a, a settler um, in a settler colonial context. Um, so I want to talk about this, um, this journey of becoming response-able, be, being able to respond, learning what that takes, what is involved in the practice um, and the intellectual work involved um, in becoming um, able to respond to the question and demand that I think is posed to all of us as non-Indigenous people um, here, here in this context um, by that very important, important statement of fact, sovereignty was never ceded. So that to me is an invitation, much like Mark just described of um, the term Bunjigiri, um, which is to demand a response. What do we say to that? How do we act? Um, how do we change our behaviour and our practices and our thinking? So that for me is kind of how I've tried to think about this journey. And I'm not presenting this as a guidebook of things you shouldn't do or things you should do or as if it was, of course, uncomplicated, um, nor to ignore or erase, and hopefully I'll bring right to the centre, um, how unsettling this kind of work should be um, because it should require us to think deeply about who we are, how we are, actually, where we are and how we are where we are. So the best way that I have ever found from any other literature or scholarly source to describe this process um, is from um, the wonderful, if dense, um, Gayatri Spivak's work, um, where she describes a process of unlearning our privilege, or unlearning my privilege in this case, as loss. Um, and I'm wanting to use that as um, a framing for understanding this, this journey. And I'll try and kind of draw out the, these three key words to me, unlearning and privilege and loss, and, and see how they have worked in my own um, sort of coming to these kinds of realisations. But to understand that story um, and why that particular framing matters, you need to understand a little bit more about me. So here's the, forgive me for the slight um, random ramble through Western Victoria. So I am a white middle class woman and I grew up in rural Australia, um, born on Jawajali country as I, as I discovered not all that long ago, um, in a lefty progressive Christian family. This was my dad's um, uniting church in the little town of Natamuk, um, just out of Horsham. And I literally had no knowledge um, of the history of relations between um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and white Australians, and certainly no appreciation through my childhood that my own privilege in this small rural community and, and others that I lived in across um, Victoria was entirely constructed from the processes of dispossession um, and oppression um, of Indigenous peoples. So as a child in rural Victoria, I was taught the things that I'm sure many of you were taught, the perniciously racialized version of Australian history, um, where Indigenous people were rendered invisible, um, uh, except when we did kind of ancient history. Um, and I remember a, a seminal moment in about grade two, I think, at school, um, where we, we did a, a project on, on the Aborigines, which was all about um, some sort of strange dark people in the north who roamed around with spears in their hands and we had to draw little pictures of them. It's kind of classic, um, classically horrifying stuff. Stuff, um, that, that was fodder um, of my own education. So as I was growing up, I became more conscious of um, the fact that they, they, these people weren't just strange dark people in the north wandering around with, with spears in their hands, but were in fact people. Um, and lived in my own community um, and began to realise that perhaps there was something really quite profoundly wrong um, with, my own, uh, with, with my own education. Um, and so I kind of embarked on a bit of a learning, personal learning journey of my own, um, trying to figure out um, a little bit more about that as a, as a rather kind of earnest um, young white woman trying to figure out some of this stuff. And one of the things that I did was to go on a, on a cultural exchange program um, where, of course, we went to far north Queensland because that's where you find real black fellas. Um, <laughs> to, um, uh, there's, a, there's a thing to unpack. Um, and it was really there um, in my kind of formative teenage years um, where I fully came to appreciate the deep inaccuracy at the heart of my own education um, and the full extent, in fact, of my own racism was completely laid bare to me um, in quite unsettling, um, perturbing ways. 
So, growing up out of that moment um, for a white educated woman in a broadly lefty Christian progressive family, what would be my response? Well, I guess it was a typical response and that was right, I will help. I will work in the field, I will do good things in order to undo um, this, this, the basis of these privileges. And so I came eventually to do a PhD because that's you know what you do, isn't it? <laughs> that really makes a tremendous impact on the world well done, Libby. <laughs> So I, so I embarked on a PhD about and, and wanted to really focus on the relationship between my discipline, which by this time I'd chosen um, as urban planning and urban geography, um, to the Indigenous land rights question, which seemed to me to be just really not spoken about at all. Um, remember, this was, um, well, you wouldn't remember because you don't know how old I am, but this was around about the time um, when uh, the Mabo decision was handed down and, you know, all of my discipline was just sort of blind to the fact that this incredible explosion in the Australian land tenure system had occurred um, and we were all just carrying on with sort of business as usual um, and hadn't kind of noticed. So I wanted to, to sort of grapple with that. So being a very good white person, I earnestly went to the library and read everything that I could get my hands on. All of it, of course, I have since come to realise, come to realise, written by white people, um, about what it means to do good uh, intellectual research on sensitive topics in intercultural communicative moments um, where you know there would be power and I would have to account for all those things. So I was literally in these moments um, learning how to be and performing being the good white woman, um, the person who was making sure that they weren't doing any of that kind of research, that wrong kind of research where we, you know, steal skulls from graves and, and, and make awful claims about people. I was, I was going to be um, quite a different person. So in, in, in realising this, um, one of the, and the reason I have this mug on my, um, on the lectern here is not in fact to hold water, it has nothing in it, um, is because it's an artefact of precisely this process. So I've brought it along for me. And if any of you have ever visited me in my office, you know I use this mug. Um, it's, my, it's my tea mug um, in my office. And I hold on to it because it dates from this moment. So it is literally an artefact of my life. Um, when I started my PhD, I thought, well, what do you do when you're like, you have an office um, and you're a PhD student and you make a claim to it, you, you buy a mug. So I thought I'd better go and buy a mug and I thought I'd better buy a mug that sort of symbolises my goodness um, and, and says something about what it is that I'm doing. So it's got really nice little, you know, Aborigine paintings on it. Um, I don't know where it's from, they're, they're probably from somewhere else. <laughs> probably, it's probably made in China. Anyway, um, this mug to me um, is a kind of artefact of this performance of presenting uh, a view to the world that I am um, engaged in some way with, with this interesting exotic thing um, that is indigeneity. Um, and, and that was how I saw it um, at the time. Um, and at the time, of course, I was just not aware of all of the things that were going on around me. I wasn't aware whose country I lived on. Um, at the time I was living in central Victoria, I lived on Jarjarung country, but I had no knowledge of that. Um, and so instead I was kind of reifying what indigeneity should be um, in, in, you know, in this kind of activity. So I'll leave that there so you can ponder it um, as, a, as an artifact. So my PhD project was uh, started out um, very much following the artefact of the mug uh, as uh, an, a, an exploration of planning as a possibility of being a space of inclusion where Aboriginal people could be included with their knowledge systems and their ways of, of being in the land um, and all those kind of things that I decided were marvellous things that we should know about. Um, and so I set out to do this uh, study on how that could be so. Um, and it was, um, of course, I assumed that there was a thing called Aboriginal knowledge that would be accessible to me, of course, um, and that I would know when I tripped over it in the field or, you know, lifted up a rock and looked underneath it, but, oh, there, look, there's Aboriginal knowledge, um, and sort of, you know, could consume it for myself, um, that I would somehow recognise it to be so. Um, and I would recognise it to be Indigenous knowledge as opposed to any other form of knowledge. Quite how I was going to discover this, I have no idea, but I had convinced myself that this was... Um, a marvellous topic. Now, about sort of uh, fairly close to the end, perilously close to the end actually, <laughs> of my PhD, I realised that this was entirely the wrong question um, and entirely the wrong framing. Um, much too late to do anything about it methodologically, oh dear, um, causing my supervisors any amount of heartache. Um, but I did write a reflective piece, um, which I reread actually this morning, um, which really tried to get at um, this realisation and how I had come this far in this process 
to not appreciate um, in, uh, what, that I have in, in um, Linda Smith's um, terminology, imperial eyes, that I saw all of this through the blinkers of whiteness. Um, and it was really only one of my participants um, who really, you know, this is of course because these things are grounded and they come at you from the field, um, who, who made me realise this. Uh, when they said, you know, Libby, we really don't want to be included necessarily. It's not really the aspiration here. Um, you're not kind of getting that we have our own sovereign domain doing our thing. The inclusion factor is a sort of, is a minor point. Um, now that wouldn't hold for, for all people, of course, but it really rocked me because it made me realise that the question I'd been asking had been entirely framed by my own presumption that wouldn't everyone want to be included in this fabulous colonial system that we'd set up to usurp land and commit genocide. Oh, sorry, no, no, to, um, <laughs> to plan for futures and, and make things right between, between people and environments. So you can imagine how, um, how kind of uh, sh shocking, I guess, this was, how unsettling it was. So then I realised, well, uh, what do I do about that? Um, how do I re-examine or rework um, this PhD being so perilously close to the end? Um, and so to cut a long story short, I, I sort of reformulated the question um, to really turn the gaze back on my own profession um, and start asking questions about how did urban planning and urban geography come to be um, as a cultural practice, as a, as a bounded discipline um, in themselves, as, as two sets of disciplines? How did they come to be set up as the natural set of worldviews about how we manage um, human environment relationships in this place when there has always been something that has been doing exactly that work. How has that come to be? Um, so this you know, completely um, changed the way I thought about the, the study and, and my discipline actually um, in, in total um, and, and that was a good thing. So I want to reflect for a moment on disciplines um, and what they are and um, and what our work is, I think, uh, particularly for non-Indigenous people within them, um, to kind of come to these realisations a whole lot quicker than I was able to at, you know, at this point in my life. So I think that disciplines are sustained by, obviously, practices, um, institutions, power and material realities. Um, and that makes me wonder about how, in, in a discipline that is intrinsically about the relationship between people and place, how it is so that, are not, that the knowledge system, I was trained here at RMIT, by the way, that the knowledge system of the Kulin Nation, which was present right here when I was studying, um, in the same course that we still teach here now, how come that knowledge system was absent not just absent, but erased um, from the structure of my own discipline, when that is all about the relationship between people and place. How could this be so? Why is the governance system of the Kulin Nation absent from how we think about how we manage this place that we now call Melbourne? And how, do, how is that absent from um, how we imagine the possibilities um, of governing for the future? Now, I understand answers to these questions, um, and I'm not going to answer them, um, but I think that the answers to them are really about power um, and about power relations. But they're about power relations that are, of course, fractured and structured through um, the lens that is settler colonialism and the privilege of whiteness. So I want to just talk um, a little bit about that and how I think about that. So Australia has colonial origins. We know that. It's not in dispute. Um, but the reality of colonisation as a perpetual logic that continues to structure uh, our social and political fabric today, um, and our material fabric today, is not only not acknowledged, but it's often hotly contested. And by that, I don't just mean, um, you know, radio shock jocks and, and, you know, crazy people in bloody parliament who don't believe it. Um, think about it like this. Who among us here today thinks that Melbourne is a colonial city? None of us would claim that. None of us think we live in a colony. Um, and, and, and our language is very clumsy around this, I think. Um, but because of the nature of the colony that we do in fact inhabit is a settler colony, which is different from other kinds of colonial endeavours, our sociality here in Melbourne remains fundamentally steeped, in my view anyway, um, in the relations of colonisation. We, we can't be, be post them because they are what constitutes our ability to be here. The form has changed. We don't live in the frontier war right now, um, but the, the structure is the same. So hence um, the slide here with Patrick Wolfe's marvellous quote, um, settler colonialism is a structure, not an event. So if we recognise that in a settler colony, settlers come to stay with the specific 
purpose or two specific purposes, usurping land and replacing an existing social order with a new one, or attempting to at least, um, then it becomes a different view about what is necessary today to understand the relationship between us um, in this place now and into the future. So uh, here I speak, of course, as a settler, right? Descended from the people who did the usurping, descended from the people who were intimately connected with the violence that is required to, to um, replace one social structure with another. Yet I'm here to stay as a settler. I'm not going anywhere, this is home. I exist in this space. So trying to figure out then what it will mean to reconceive of that relationship um, is obviously you know, kind of hard um, and, <laughs> and should challenge us, but also really quite unsettling about how we understand ourselves as white settlers to be at home. And one of the um, ways, and, and Mark mentioned a few of these things that I'm trying to think about this in my own work in relation to my discipline, is to examine what enables, what structures enable my staying or our staying collectively, of course, um, as um, not as many of us as non-Indigenous people. Um, so those are things like private property, urban development, the ontological separation of nature from culture, the way we see land, the institutionalisation of knowledge making in universities, Westphalian sovereignty, liberal democracy, we could go on. These are the structures that maintain and sustain our being in this place um, as a settler colony. So this then is how I kind of understand my privilege in, in the settler position of a settler colonial relation, um, but also want to think about my whiteness um, within that as well. And here I'm considering whiteness very much inspired by Sarah Ahmed's work on whiteness, um, not as a skin colour, although it is that too, of course, um, and it, carry, it must carry that, but as a habit, a disposition, an ideology. So my whiteness in, settler, in a settler colonial context is a very specific formulation of relationship that I cannot escape or transcend though I am convinced and will always remain convinced that I can come to know it better, to apprehend it better, and that knowing it matters. I'm not sure how all the time, but I'm convinced that knowing it better matters. Um, and while I don't want it to be in the centre of what I do, it needs to be a part of my thinking. So my whiteness, of course, is carried in my appearance, but as, and following, um, wonderful people like Sarah Ahmed here, also exceeds my appearance because it's already determining where I can be, where I'm already oriented to, um, because my whiteness has gone before me, in effect. It has anticipated my arrival. Um, it expects me in the room. That's, that's how the structure of, of the privilege of whiteness functions. Um, and at the same time, it raises the category um, altogether, of course, because um, we don't often, we, we register indigeneity, we register other kinds of difference. Um, we don't often register whiteness and how that's operating as a category of being um, in the world and what it does. So it disappears from view as a category at, it, at precisely the moment that it's become active, that it's, that it's working in the world. That is, of course, its great conceit. And that's very resonant, I think, with the great conceit that is settler colonialism, colonialism because it does precisely the same thing. All of the structures that uphold a settler colony, like I, like I just spoke about before, are at the same moment they're working, are rendered invisible. We can't see them, they become normalised. They're just the normal way we go about our business, right? So the structure of staying, like we're doing right now, of making ourselves at home in an institution of knowledge making in a Western university, is normalised. It's entirely a natural practice of our being in this place. It's expected, it's welcomed, um, it's anticipated. Um, and, and so, and at the same moment rendered invisible. So this has always seemed to me to beg a kind of essential question and a set of tasks um, that we have to be more explicit about um, our scholarly disciplines in, in this kind of light. So to come back to the sort of realisation I'd had in my PhD that I'd asked the wrong question, basically of what it would take to include um, Indigenous knowledge making or Indigenous land practices within the discipline of planning, Instead, we can sort of flip the table on that and ask how is the discipline of planning or any other sustained and maintained as if it were the only authority on people-place relationships in a context where systems and knowledges for governing people-place relationships were always here. 
um, and were always present. So this is the work, I think, of kind of holding the mirror up to our disciplines, to quote Peter West um, and Michael Miller. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and see how we can engage our work in that task. So sometimes um, that work, I think, should be done in partnership with communities and with Indigenous communities. And sometimes that's not possible and sometimes it's not necessary or should in fact not be necessary. And I want to talk through um, a little bit of that as well. So, so this work of holding the mirror up, I think, is, is work that um, should be you know, a burden borne by whiteness, basically, but burden borne by us on the inside of these fields. So let me address my field in particular. So the my field of urban studies and planning um, has been sort of singularly dreadful, I would say. Um, in a paper I wrote recently, I said a miserable failure um, at even doing the basic work of acknowledging the complicity um, with its, uh, its own complicity with colonial process and structure. So this enables urban studies to literally get away with whitewashing history, to reconstitute places um, as if they were kind of naturally white possessions. And evidence of this denial is absolutely everywhere um, in urban studies. So everybody knows that there were people here before, you know, we got here and did this kind of thing. Um, but we just choose to maintain that, you know, the starting point of, of all Australian cities, for example, is the moment when British settlers arrived um, and started laying out their, you know, surveys and their, and their, their land markets. Um, and we proceed with our analyses in the field as if sort of theft and genocide never happened and are irrelevant rather than foundational to our existence in urban Australia. Um, we know that cities and towns are important to Indigenous people because most of all of us actually in this continent live here, yet we just have this kind of myopia about how they're relevant um, and how we might think about um, the urban experience um, in different kinds of ways. All of the time frames in my field are marked by whiteness. They are the march of colonial possession um, writ large without ever mentioning that that's what's going on um, in those texts. All of the theoretical frameworks we have for explaining processes of producing cities, of creating urbanisation, um, are all fundamentally silent on the underlying endurance of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sovereignties. Fundamentally silent. So as a consequence, we not only commit a grave fucking sin, basically, and, and do something that's completely unjust, but it's just inaccurate. It's just wrong. It's incorrect. It's like wrong history. We, we just have not enabled ourselves to grapple correctly with who we are and where we are. And this seems to be just a fundamental problem that um, we should address. By the way, making that kind of statement um, in my field, there is open hostility to that. Um, so just to put that out there as well. <laughs> okay, so what I'm trying to sort of flesh out here is the, are the kind of practices and intellectual engagements necessary for unlearning privilege um, as loss, as, as I said before. And that's a different orientation than including people in a, in, in a, in a field. Um, it's, it's different from doing Indigenous research, which people often say I do, which sends a small shiver down my spine. Um, so I want to talk um, a little bit more, if I've got time, have I got time? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, about uh, the kind of impulse or surge um, that I sense happening um, in my field and, and in many other fields um, about this kind of mode of including um, Indigenous people in, in research. And, 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 I, and I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm using tones of voice that might indicate that I think that that's a silly thing to do and I, and I shouldn't do that. Um, I get a bit caustic sometimes, sorry. Um, so I am very um, um, open to that, of course, and want that to happen. I want the university to be an open place and I want us to do good research in partnership with, with communities and all of that. But I worry um, because some, so much of that surge and impulse um, comes through this lens of whiteness, I think, that, and doesn't see um, what's really going on. Um, so I want to um, kind of unpack that a little bit um, because, of course, I'm never suggesting that... Um, and people often say that I am suggesting, and I never am suggesting that, oh, we should, are you saying, Libby, that we should all go and just do Indigenous research or we should all partner up with Indigenous communities and you know, have more Indigenous content in our, in our thing that we're doing? Um, no, I'm not saying that. Because um, quite apart from the fact that we you know, completely exhaust um, the, the, the folk in organisations who are already overwhelmed and under, under um, 
overwhelmed and under-resourced um, to, to kind of respond to this surge of interest after centuries of totally ignoring people um, seems kind of you know, not the way to proceed. Um, so, I, so I'm not advocating that at all. So I want to just share a little story with you about some work um, to try and flesh this out a little bit more. Some work we've been doing um, in uh, a sort of research hub called the Clean Air and Urban Landscapes Hub, um, which part of which is located here in RMIT, where a lot of work is, uh, is underway to try and monitor and think about how we can produce a more sustainable urban environment. These are really good things um, with projects on urban greening and forests and air quality monitoring and livability and all those kinds of things. Now, the hub has an Indigenous advisory group which is working extremely effectively to try and guide and shape um, where the work of the hub connects and how it should connect um, with Indigenous knowledges and communities, and that's been terrific. And then this little moment came around um, where there was an opportunity for a little bit of extra funding, um, and I was asked if you know there would be something interesting that we that I could contribute um, and get involved. So I thought here's an opportunity because the funding wasn't kind of tied to a specific moment in the in the hub's work. Here's an opportunity to sort of test something out, try something a little bit different. Um, so you know, always up for a. A almost unfunded challenge um, <laughs> with very little resource. Yay! Um, let's. I dived in boots and all and thought, okay, what can what can we do? Um, and I'd like to acknowledge here um, the work of my my wonderful colleague, who um, sadly isn't my colleague anymore because she's moved on to wonderful other things. Lauren Arabina, um, who supported this work and was in fact the Centre for Urban Research's first ever Indigenous Urban Sustainability Research Officer, which was a, a thing in itself um, to to have achieved. Anyway, Lauren and I set out on this journey to try and figure out if we could kind of flip the table um, on the pres this presumption in academic research that white researchers in Western universities can think up research projects and then think it would be nice to have Indigenous people involved because that's a good thing that we should do and go out and communicate and consult and ask people to engage. So words like engagement and participation and inclusion are all important in this kind of model. Now, as I said before, I'm not meaning to dismiss that model because it has its role um, and it can be extremely important and in fact it can be quite transformative in some instances. But I am worried that nothing ever changes with that model because it's an incorporation model. It's inclusion through enclosure, effectively. Um, and so what we were trying to do was test, well, what would it mean? How, how would you do it if you didn't do it like that within the confines of a, of a, of a funded project um, with kind of government overseeing it and all of the requirements of ethics and reporting and all that stuff that goes on um, alongside it? What would it mean to do that? And we really wanted to push up against um, what I think of as kind of whitely ways of doing research, right? Where we look for the knowledge that we can capture rather than the people we can relate to or who hold that knowledge. Where we try and look for um, traditions rather than practices. Um, where researchers are accustomed to business as usual, to having their voice right in the centre, um, defining how this thing will occur. What would it be like to not do that? What would the not doing that look like and feel like, be practised like? We didn't get anywhere close to being able to do that, but it became clear that um, at, at heart, what we needed to do was establish relationships, of which Laura and I already had many, um, so that was good. Um, but we decided we would just use our resource to try and open conversations to see where they led with no agenda um, other than we wanted to be in relationship. And the whole process was completely revealing of a number of things. Haven't got time to delve too much into them, but I'll, I'll give you a tiny taste. We got completely tangled up in ethics processes because the ethics committee couldn't figure out that this was research. They kept saying, it isn't research. What are, you, what are you doing? There's no methods. And we're like, we're just having cups of tea. And they're like, well, that's not research. And we're like, but it is. It needs ethical oversight. Um, but they couldn't see that this was a process of knowledge production just done in a different way. Um, so we got really tangled up in that, um, revealing all sorts of interesting questions about where we think research begins and ends and with whom. Um, we found ourselves with the challenge of communicating to social scientists and scientists a really circular relational approach that did not look like findings and methods and um, you know, literature reviews and, and frameworks, conceptual frameworks. It was completely um, relational and circular. So we could no longer unpick 
the findings from ourselves on the journey. It was just impossible to do that. So the story we ended up writing is very much a story of how that unfolded. Um, and that was, that was really challenging um, and quite kind of, you know, revealing of where we need to kind of puncture um, into these, these ways of, of doing things. So, so there's a little story um, about, about that kind of stuff. Now, one other thing I want to reflect on um, in relation to this inclusion thing is that the placemaking and place studying disciplines, planning, built environment, geography and others, um, are centrally engaged, as they should be, with some of the kind of key crises of our times. You know, I think the climate might be changing, that kind of stuff. Um, and in that concern, there is, you know, we're, sweep, we're swept up in this incredible surge in interest towards Indigenous knowledge system because they are, you know, patently and demonstrably more sustainable than the thing we've invented. Um, and they're much better ways of organising life on the planet. Um, so I agree with that. As the wonderful Alexis Wright has described, the continent now known as Australia and the Aboriginal peoples of this continent are the oldest library in the world, the land, sea and skies of country. So there's this kind of surge to consume that knowledge to, and to make it part of who we are from, for good intentions. Um, you know, the climate's changing and that kind of thing. We need to figure out how to get around that. Um, but what, has, what I think has happened um, is that some of these concepts get turned into a method of enclosure effectively. Um, so we have um, ways in which Indigenous perspectives become consumed in um, literatures about how we might green our cities or how we might make them more sustainable. Um, so I think these um, don't so much include, as I've said, but enclose and fail to appreciate that there really is no right to research. There is no right to assume access to that library, um, to the oldest library on earth um, and, and that those failures to understand that are not merely oversight or error but a feature of the structure of, of whiteness, of settler colonialism. They are a constituent part of that. They're not sort of a mistake that we made and we can kind of go, oh, terribly sorry, um, Aboriginal people will try and do that differently. They are a constituent feature of our impulse to consume and usurp and replace. So I often hear in response to this kind of critique, oh yeah, Libby, so you know, we're damned if we do, and we're damned if we don't, aren't we? What should we do um, as a consequence? And I want to challenge us here to say that it's precisely in that response um, that we hear white privilege echoing again um, and the settler colonial order revealed. Because if you're like me and you have imperial eyes, we assume that the world is open to us always, knowable to us always, that we can access and make the world knowable through our empirical endeavours always. Learning is held as a privilege. We have the right to know things. It's possible to be in our position looking out on them over there, looking out, consuming Indigenous perspectives. And I think we have to understand this as a construct of these historically constituted relations and that this should be part of our analysis, part of holding up the mirror um, to our disciplines um, and to our, own, um, to our own practices. So another way of putting this model of inclusion is to think about also how this uh, inclusive kind of gesture also displaces responsibility. And it's to this that I just want to try and land this thing um, if I can. <laughs> Because actually I think much of the work that needs doing is on our side of the ledger, how being the, the settler side um, of the ledger. We, we cannot participate genuinely um, in a sovereign relationship if we have not made the effort to unpick the complicity of our social structures, the ones we've invented, our knowledge systems and our disciplines in the colonial project. We, it, we just, we, we're not even at first base if we can't at least try and do that. Well, let me put it differently. When Aboriginal colleagues um, rightly and, and often complain to me about having to teach white students white history, why do I, you know, I hear people say to me all the time, Libby, why do I always have to teach, you know, your mob your history? Why, why don't you know that stuff? Why doesn't your, your mob know that stuff? So the burden of reconfiguring history rests on the very people whom that history denies. Um, so we need to become intelligent enough and mature enough to see that actual practice as a structure of racialised privilege, constituent feature of the settler colonial relation. So becoming response able in a relationship is to become more mature and intelligent, I think, kind of to grow up, um, about this difference. This difference between work that can only um, and should be done by the right knowledge holders work and work that is completely on us. 
um, and, some, and the work that's in partnership as well, there should be a third there. Well, we need to become more adept, I think, and more mature at working in different registers. There are times when we need to lend our bodies, our white bodies and our intellects and our resources and our privilege and our solidarity to help hold a space but not take up a space which can be taken up by others. Or to walk away and not be involved at all or to be told that this isn't for you. And there are also times and other times where we have to bear the burden um, and, and shoulder entirely um, the work of holding up a mirror to our disciplines and our own practices. And we can't keep asking um, Indigenous people for validation of that. We've just got to get on and do it um, and mature ourselves, mature our discipline in this relationship. So I think these are some of the practices involved in becoming um, response able in a relationship with um, Indigenous sovereignties. Now, of course, recognising privilege and acknowledging that you have imperial eyes you know, it doesn't remove your eyes um, and it doesn't necessarily shift um, racialized relations of power. And as the wonderful Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang teach us, critical consciousness does not translate into action that disrupts settler colonialism. Decolonization is not a metaphor. So it, there is no, I think, comfortable place in reality from which to undertake good white research. There's no safe, ethically bounded space where all the rules are written from where we can kind of anticipate a better model, an acceptable model. It's in the practice of figuring it out. And I don't have any prescriptions or, um, and I'm always suspicious of prescriptions for how to do that, but what I think is at stake is our maturing, our non-Indigenous maturing of being more ourselves, of being more at home, understanding who we are and where we are within the invitation of sovereign relationship. And that, I think, is what it means to come to live lawfully in country. Thank you. You can hit that. All right. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Um, I go too long, sorry. No, 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 not at all. Um, and hence, this is why Libby is exceptional. Uh, so we'll open up the floor before we thank Libby wholeheartedly. Wow, these people have You've made them nervous because you said white people. <laughs> Excuse my um, question if it comes from the wrong place, Libby, but um, I'm just curious about whiteness and your take on um, the higher principle of humanity and perhaps the loss of humanity in that. And I'm, I, I'd love to hear your take on that. Yeah, that I, I really resonated with it preceding before us. Yep. And, um, just tell me, before you hand back the microphone, tell me more about what you mean by loss of do, do you mean in... The connection with humanity, I guess, like our own humanity, the broader humanity, and I'm wondering how that fits into your take on this whole area. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, just a question. Yeah, I mean, so I'm kind of, I'm interpreting you as saying, does focusing on our difference, whiteness, indigeneity, whatever, um, render us not able to access our humanness? Mm. No, I don't think so. Um, I think it gives us a sharper... Do you want to answer? <laughs> no, no, this is your gig. Well, you just, <laughs> just did your thing just then. See that? He that says it's not my gig and then tries I to guess, I guess my it's belief true. is um, have we lost touch with our own humanness and... Are you helping us regain it when we start to talk about this? Yeah. Um, so I think, no, I don't think it does. I think it gives us a sharper understanding of um, the ways in which our humanness has come to be constituted. So the thing that Mark was whispering in my ear that I was already going to say, so <laughs> there, uh, was, of course, that you know, whiteness rendered indigeneity not human, um, less than human, right? That's how you got to actually... That's how we got to be like this. <laughs> um, so I think... It, I, I don't think it, 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 um, it causes such a fracture or dissonance between us that we can't then understand each other or have a relationship. I think it sharpens our understanding of the nature of the relationship. Um, and I think that's really important. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Mark.
You already had it covered. If we weren't in that setting, I would call that mansplaining. <gasps> <laughs> We shall take that up later. <laughs> it's clearly my shout for dinner now. I'm just really interested in that project you talked about with the ethics. Yep. Um, yeah, it was pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it seems like it's so important to be sort of open to changing those practices. Yeah. And like, how do we the, do that? The practice of procedural ethics. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And how do we challenge that? And yeah, um, I th I think in the doing of it, because I, mm. I think part of it is figuring it out as you're going, thinking why does this not feel at all ethical? Yeah. And then trying to unpack that, um, which we did, I think, to to a good extent in that process. And um, one of the things that happened that Mark was, was um, helping me with and involved with um, was the ethics protocol. As soon as you tick the box for, are you engaging with Indigenous people? Yes. Then, you know, uh, like 25,000 pages of ethics form suddenly appears and you have to, you know, do a whole lot of other acrobatics to, <laughs> to get ethics approval, which, again, I'm sorry, I'm not being caustic and dismissive. That's very important. Like, it's tremendously important. But one of the um, actions in that is to have a letter of approval or a kind of um, statement of support, which also can be really important, um, from, from an Indigenous organisation or partner group or whoever it is you're working with to sort of validate you. Um, and, of course, we didn't have that because... We were wanting ethical oversight of the research process that went into establishing the relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was no obvious person to go to. And anyway, it was kind of unethical asking people to tick a box for a university when the whole purpose of the research was to, to work within the construct of what ethics means in an Indigenous sovereign relationship. So it was this kind of incredibly circular um, messing with head moment um, of trying to figure that out. And eventually the ethics committee were pretty good about it, um, but there remained this real discomfort um, that I sensed when, with the comments we got back from, from ethical, ethics reviewers um, about that it's not, res pardon me, it's not research, um, that we, it didn't look like the, the production of knowledge, um, which didn't, you know, in the sense that we decided that looks like, um, and I think that's really telling. I don't know how to fix it, but anyway, we'll leave that with Mark. <laughs> uh, one question I've been thinking about recently, mostly thanks to Peter and Mark, is if we have an ancestor who has done something specific that's known, that's documented, um, that led to the death of Indigenous people, or a particular person, what's our responsibility in that? And I just can't figure my way through that question. Wow. But you've got to do it. Hmm? But you have to answer it. Now. Is that right? You want me to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I have those ancestors. Um, I don't know of specific people that lost their lives as a consequence, um, because that's less documented, actually, in many ways. Um, but I do know that I have that I come from stock um, of those people. Um, so I guess my answer is that we find ways to um, do what I just said over the last 40 minutes or so, pretty much. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't think it's as awkward or corny as kind of apologising for that kind of thing, although maybe in some circumstances that can be useful, but, but I've never felt that way inclined. Um, but I think it's about understanding where you come from, making that's part of your story um, of who you are. It's not, I'm not, ash I mean, I'm, I guess I'm ashamed. Am I ashamed? I don't think I'm ashamed. I'm, I feel um, humbled, I guess, by where I come from and how it is that I am enabled to be here because of that story. But it doesn't make me feel like, you know, I kind of want to hide my head and, and run away and never speak to an Aboriginal person because it would be so embarrassing that pe the people that I'm related to did this awful thing. Because uh, I didn't do it, um, right? <laughs> um, 
So I think it's about trying to come into a better form of relationship with our own story here and knowing that um, and then making it real in how we respond. All Australians were complicit in genocide at the turn of the 20th century. That's true too. That was part of our organisational structure. That was the settler colonialism as a structure. Genocide was the legal anticipation of um, the move to the Federation. That's why the Commonwealth wasn't allowed to legislate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people until 1967, because they were expressly forbidden because the state bore the legal burden of the eradication of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, so it's not to say that we need to be held accountable and guilty as individuals, but how do we, knowing that now, inform our current practice of what it is that is worth knowing? So you don't need to know that from a guilt-laden, I need to be sort of uh, hand-wringing, um, guilt, again, guilt, because white guilt and white fragility is a thing. It's an activity as well as a consciousness. And where does understanding where that comes from um, also enables that ability to know where you want to go to, which is Bunjagiri itself. What is it worth sharing? And it is the future. So, and as Libby so eloquently pointed out, uh, whiteness and whiteness in its, its broader term, how do we get to, how do you get to know that well enough so that you can actually ask the question of what it is that we want to share with us, which is the future. But as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ontology and or epistemology, the past, present and future coexist. So temporality becomes really important, but that's also something that non-Indigenous Australians can learn about the relationship itself. So you don't need to actually go, every Australian, whether born here or not, um, had uh, ancestors, people in their lineage, that actually were, has bought into the eradication of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They're just facts now. It's what you do with the facts and how do you learn to unknow or know something in a particular way that is of use. Um, not just of use to you, but of use to society. And that's where you can start to go, we've all got death in our DNA. But Bunjagiri is the ability to actually put um, past and present into a particular constellation that allows for future looking by having those things situating in the moment. So that that was the um, the upshot of what I think Libby um, was trying to say. Yep. Well, no, you said it, and I'm not mansplaining, nor queersplaining, <laughs> nor any splaining, <laughs> other than there's a resonance. And it's, it's also how do we learn to listen deeply to when people are saying these things aren't as hard as we actually imagine them to be. And Libby was a really good I'm not explaining Libby's shit again, but uh, <laughs> as an example, because I'm, I'm that's kind of like fucking, it's rocked my world. Oh, God, I've mansplained somebody. That's terrible. <laughs> um, oh, no, oh, you all need to pay for dinner now. No. Uh, so this is cost saving by RMIT. It's an executive thing. Um, but because that question is really what Bunjagiri is about. <laughs> Fabulous professor. <laughs> no, we've got time for more questions. <laughs> One more. Please don't make it about white guilt. <laughs> Thank you, Libby. That was just fantastic. Um, I guess it maybe it's picking up on what you you were saying here, but also being part of these um, workshops as mm. well, and the idea of focusing on discipline. And because I'm an urban planner as well. And I'm just thinking about the idea of being in relation to my own discipline, mm -hmm. given what you're saying is about knowing yourself, knowing your discipline better. Um, and I think, you know, that the lens that we've probably had is the, we hate our discipline because it reflects everything that's wrong with capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the usual sort of level of critique. Mm -hmm. And this brings a whole other mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. of critique. I guess. Thinking about that and then thinking about the idea of practices within a discipline or disciplines as constructed by practices, mm -hmm. what do you think the knowing of your discipline might do 
to the changing of practices? Or is it through practices that you change? I'm, I'm just, I don't really have a question <laughs> exactly. Well, I think but if you know, it's connecting yeah. the practices and the discipline is what I'm, yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's always hard to, I find personally, it hard to separate um, practice from, from whatever is on the outside of practice. <laughs> <laughs> what is on the outside of practice? Thinking. Um, so, you know, we do this classic thing in planning in particular where there's researchers and then there's practice. Um, as if scholarship was not a practice and education was not a practice. I've always found this completely bizarre um, because, of course, we practice what we do. That's how we do it, through practice. So, to me, I can't separate those things out from each other, which was, I think was why with that call report, um, it became, impo for, and for other reasons too, it became impossible to separate out the thinking from the doing, the thinking from the being, actually. Um, we couldn't explain how it was that we'd come to know things without explaining who we were on the journey and where the journey had taken us and to whom the journey had put us into conversation with. Um, and. I, I think that that's a bit instructive for how we might proceed unpacking our disciplines a little bit more um, to, to sort of let go a little bit of um, the requirements of, we can't always do this of course because they, they are requirements, um, of university you know, rules or, or of the rules of scholarship in fact. Because you know, one of the things we're doing when we're practising our, our research and our scholarship is to reconstitute the rules of the scholarship, um, right? We we, re, we reorganise the boundaries of it by continuing to to stay inside of it and not to poke out of it and or stand out on the outside and throw hand grenades in or whatever it might be that we do. Um, so I so I think we need to work at, the, at those kind of edges and 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 make them fuzzier um, and and poke through them and find ways um, and they're sometimes really small. Um, like acknowledging country, I think, at the opening of your paper or um, as fabulous colleagues um, in, in the field of, of geography do, um, write with country, um, countries of first author, um, you know, and, and not in a consuming, um, enclosing kind of way, um, in, a, in an utterly relational kind of way where they're coming to know their own practices, researchers in conversation with country. Um, so I think there are ways to do this. Um, and we just have to get more intelligent and more mature um, and more in intuitive um, as to how to do them. That was a very good answer. It's my yes, best it effort. Is. It was a nice answer and a nice question to finish on because, you know, uh, not only do we need to thank Libby, um, and I'm not sure that you can actually get more intelligent, that it's a physical impossibility, I think. Uh, but please um, join me in thanking Libby for being able to give us a, a light that we might actually want to work towards. So thank you so much for the business.